in revolutionary dialogue. Get ready to feel good and go deep. This is Bespoken Bones. Hi, and welcome to Bespoken Bones, ancestors at the crossroads of sex, magic, and science. We're in the business of healing trauma, connecting with our roots, and developing radiant erotic wellness in past, present, and future generations. And we are host, Pavani Moray. It's such a pleasure today to welcome Ayana Omilade Fluellen. She is a Black feminist, an archaeologist, a storyteller, and an artist. She is the co-founder of the Society of Black Archaeologists and sits on the board of Diving with a Purpose. Currently, Dr. Fluellen is a UC President's Postdoctoral Fellow at the University of California, Berkeley. She will start an appointment as an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology at UC Riverside this spring. Her research and teaching interests are shaped by and speak to Black feminist theory, historical archaeology, maritime heritage conservation, public and community-engaged archaeology, processes of identity formations, and representations of slavery. Her current book project, tentatively titled A Black Feminist Archaeology of Adornment, examines sartorial practices of self-making among African-American tenant, sharecropping, and land-owning farmers in post-emancipated Texas. Sartorial practices in this forthcoming work are defined as social cultural practices shaped by many intersecting operations of power and oppression, including racism, sexism, and classism, that involve modifications of the corporeal form, for example, scarification, body piercings, and hair alteration, and all three-dimensional supplements added to the body, for example, clothing, hair combs, and jewelry. And I highly encourage you to check out Ayana and more about her work at her website, which is ayanafluellen.com. I'm going to spell it A-Y-A-N-A-F-L-E-W-E-L-L-E-N.com. Ayana, hi, welcome. Hi, thank you so much again for this opportunity. I'm so glad to have you here. Um, I know that you have a really special relationship with your ancestors, and I wonder if you'd be willing to just talk a little bit about um, how you connect with them, a way that you connect with them, a way that they make their presence known in your life. Um, I love my ancestors, (laughs) and they cover me in so much love and protection daily. For me, I should say that the work that I do um, as an archaeologist, I work at sites of enslavement and sites of post-emancipation. And the work that I have in Texas is truly an ode to my ancestors, especially my mothers. Um, We date back to 1852 in Texas, Central Texas. And the work itself is really talking about the ways that Black women um, dress their bodies during post-emancipation to really be in negotiation and conversation with racism, with sexual exploitation, um, with economic disenfranchisement. So the work that I do is an ode to my ancestors who I feel came really to me and were like, hey, this is the story that needs to be told and you're the person needs to tell it. Um, So I know that when you ask like how I feel them, I feel them in the work that I do. um, And I feel them in the home that I have as well. I have an ancestor altar in my home space that um, I light and sit with once a week and just am in communion with them in that space. Um, And it also shows up in my jewelry making and adornment making practice, which is named after my great grandmother, um, who really in 2014 really showed up beautifully as a protector and a guide for me and the work that I do in that space. So 
they've shown up in a number of different ways and different facets of my life. When you say they show up, I'm imagining that you mean you have either dreams or kind of real-time experiences of communing with them. I'm just wondering if you'd be willing to say a little bit more. Dream space, definitely. Like I can, I can daydream and fall asleep at night and think of jewelry designs that come up um, and the work that I do like with crafting. And certainly like in the process of writing the dissertation and now in this process of writing the book, um, those dream spaces and daydream spaces have become spaces of communion with them. When I need to figure something out, work through something, sit with photographs, um, it's in that space that they show up and they're like, this is what this photograph is saying to me. And I want to say that the first sort of practice of that coming into existence for me was actually not with um, a blood or like in a like a kin ancestor a goon of mine. Um, that first experience happened with me like back in 2013 um, when I was actually writing my master's thesis at the University of Texas at Austin and I wrote a piece on the representations of black women at public heritage sites that discuss enslavement. And I focused on this historical character, Anna Kingsley, who was this um, Senegalese woman who owned and operated her own plantation and owned and operated and owned enslaved individuals in Florida in the early 19th, in the early 19th century. Um, and at the time was, quote unquote, legally married to a white man named Zephaniah Kingsley. And I talked about how the heritage site didn't at all really discuss the complexities of that relationship or dive into experiences of sexual violence, um, sexual exploitation, rape. It had a very romanticized story about Anna Kingsley. And it was during 2013 when I was writing that piece that I started having dreams of not only Anna, but other Black women who live at the Kingsley Plantation. Um, and it radically shifted the work that I did. And rather than having this very um, sort of material-based discussion about that site, like part of the work was a really a creative writing piece that came to me from um, the women at that site. And it came to me in dream spaces. Um, and I would, I would fall asleep and I would wake up and they would speak. And I feel like it was really a practice of, in a communion with storytellers, where it's just like, no, this is how the story should have been told. So it's been a really interesting journey to see who all shows up when you're open or when I'm open. This is something I've heard from many different artists um, who are working with ancestors or transestors of like the the way that the relationship starts to evolve and unfold with like being in their archives or being on the the sites of wherever the the thing that was happening was. And it sounds like um, yeah, I'm just curious and. It's not necessary and we can edit it out totally if, if you don't have access to it. But I just wonder if there's anything that you want to share from that creative writing project. Um, oh, wow. <laughs> it's, yeah, I'm fine if not, but it just sounds yeah, like, oh, that would be beautiful to hear a little bit of it. Um, I could actually, I could look for some of it on my laptop. Okay. So it was called um, Three Wazals an exploration of possibility. And the title came from a ship leisure that talked about the three women who Zephaniah Kingsley had um, purchased. And I wanna say this was either during his time in Cuba or it was in Florida. Um, we know that Anna was one of the three women that was purchased by Zephaniah. So it opens with the title, 
Anna Anta Majin and Jai Kingsley. Um, and it reads, the only thing I felt was Sophie's hand grasping mine, no sight or smell, just her touch and her spirit warm next to me. The ship had stopped sailing, so the rocking wasn't as fierce, but I stopped feeling the water tugging at my stomach after the first Van Weir passed. Sophia wasn't so lucky, so when the red man whose skin was pale but scorched by the sun led us, I'd hold Sophie over the edge of the ship as she threw up with little water and food she was able to get down. It was often. She had gotten so weak that I often felt her slip from me at night, but if I held her and whispered honey-soaked words in her ear while she slept, she'd make sure she'd wait the next day. For me, she'd say. But I sang for her, and during our time on the wooden vessel, we kept each other alive while the bodies chained around us wasted away. Their souls dived into the water beneath us and they basked in the saltiness because they knew they were going home. Mama was gonna take them, but what about us skin folk? So that's just one of the first paragraphs. Wow, I've not read this Mm. out loud in a very long time. It might be asking to be read out loud, is my sense. (laughs) And I'm curious of the the work um, that you were doing around Anna Kingsley. Did it? I mean, my experience with with ancestors sometimes is that there's something that needs to be resolved, or something that needs to be acknowledged, or is there some kind of justice that that needs to happen? And I'm I'm just curious if you had that sense, or if there was anything that in your relationship with her she was needing. I think it was this. Um, this issue and this this need, it was almost like a haunting, really, where there's, Avery Gordon has this book called um, Ghostly Matters, where she talks about haunting as they're needing, as a something that needs to be done. And that's the feeling behind the haunting. Um, and that definitely resonated with me as I was doing work with Anna Kingsley, where here was this Black woman and all of her complexity, the Senegalese woman, and all of her complexity who was brought from the continent of Africa to this new world, um, and against all odds was in this engagement with capitalism in this way that afforded her land ownership, afforded her um, ownership over other African um, people. Like it was, it was a very complex story of Black womanhood in my eyes, and I felt that as well. And the site itself had a very truncated narrative around who she was, how she operated, um, the space that she took up on that, or the spaces that were available to her on that plantation site. Um, And I felt, and, and I feel like the sort of drive or desire was to say that, you know, I took up all this space. I did all of this work and labor on this plantation and this being Anna. And there needs to be a reckoning with that. Um, And it was a reckoning not only for her, but for other Black women who had lived on that site as well. There had to be a reckoning for what had taken place. And part of that is due not only to the narrative that the National Park Service had about that site, Um, but also to the historical work that had been written about these historical figures. There's a book um, called Zephaniah Kingsley, um, and it has a number of different titles, and one of them is Benevolent Slave Owner, um, which is an oxymoron to me. I'm like, you can't be benevolent and enslave other beings. And I take that up even as I talk about like the space that Anna Um, occupied as well. Like there is definite harm that comes from that. And it has to be, that also is like the complexity that has to be reckoned with. Um, So I feel like there is all this romanticization about um, that time period rather than a real reveling in the complexity of it. And it definitely is something that needed to be said out loud where it's like, no, like this is a very complex history. The lives of these black women who were 
and faced sexual exploitation on a daily basis, like this is something that has to be talked about and is central to this and is central to this space. And part of it is also that the sort of main space where she was talked about was also um, the kitchen site where it was said that she lived um, in a separate dwelling from the main house in this kitchen site. And I also, in the same vein, I was just like, if we think about the plantation, if we think about the access that um, plantation owners had to this site, if we think about the ways in which she operated and was said to have run this plantation site when Zephyrhia was an absentee, which was often, then why would we only talk about her in this kitchen site as well when we talk about other um, white historical figures in every space on that land? So I definitely feel like the reckoning was also a reckoning with the historical narratives that had been written about Anna and also just like an ownership of the space as well in the geography. And like I said, not just for her, but in general around how Black women are talked about during the era of enslavement. How does it feel different to you now that you've done this piece of work it's like it's almost like you've like made it more whole or made it more complex and more nuanced that there's there's more available. I'm just curious if like you have any sense of what's different either in her story in her lineages or in that um on that land or in you like what's different I think like what that whole experience taught me about my own being about my own work is that there has to be a communion with spirit before anything else. And um, I think about that going into the work that I do in Texas. Um, and then my current work, I currently excavate at a site on St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. It's a 18th century Danish sugar plantation. And I work on that site with about four other um, scholars. And Every year that we go down to St. Croix and we excavate at the estate Little Princess, we do a libation ceremony prior to putting a shovel in the ground. And there's just the way that, like, for me, what has shifted is that what makes the work possible, what makes the research possible, um, is this knowing that it's a conversation with the ancestors. It's a knowing that the knowledge that we gain from this space is only knowledge that's been gained because they've allowed access to it. So that's definitely like what has shifted in me and my approach to this research, especially in a field that very much likes to position itself as staunchly um, scientific and empirically data driven in some regards um, or in some strands of it where the work that I do with my colleagues is more of in a vein of um, slow archaeology, where it's just, you know, we have to take time to really be present with everything that is on this land prior to digging, prior to doing the research, prior to asking this question. It's interesting. I, I've interviewed a number of um, Black feminist academics, and I would say that that's the golden thread through everything that I've um, been honored to hear is that it's not that academic, like the academy isn't separate from spirit. Like there's this, this integral quality of ritual, yeah. of listening, of slowing down, of acknowledging, of honoring that there's like, it's, I mean, it's like a, it's just a really different way of being with an academic process mm -hmm. that, um, yeah. 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 I feel absolutely. really grateful for that. Yeah. And, um, it's, I feel like it's for me at least, um, it's been rejuvenating. Like it's, it's been, it's been like what has made the work possible. And I don't have statistics offhand, but I know from talking to a number of colleagues, you know, being a Black woman in academia is a space of, um, can be a space of isolation in a lot of ways. And I feel like a tool and technique of survival in this space, a tool and technique of wellness in this space is really just understanding 
the network that you have and part of that network are the ancestors that show up in that space with us that we tap into that I tap into that may being in a space that can feel so isolating that can feel so um, devaluing in a lot of ways um, that I know why I'm there I know who's there with me I know who has my back when I'm in those spaces um, and I know what's possible I know I'm possible because of who's there with me mm-hmm. I'm just thinking about when I was on uh, ancestral pilgrimage a few years ago in England and Scotland, I went to a bunch of archaeology museums Mm. and in some of them, I mean, I mean, obviously the adornments were amazing. And um, in one museum in particular, I, uh, I got to touch the thing. Like they had this, like, you know, basically like a, it's not a, petting zoo it's like a show and tell for kids Mm. you know where they bring special things out and then people get to touch them and i was like i want to touch the thing so i got to to touch some of the like the combs and the things that my people used but um one of the things that was really deeply disturbing was that they had human remains in Mm. glass boxes right and i just it it just seems so weird and off to me of like how can science like for the sake of science we're gonna exhume this skeleton and and put it on display and talk about how it died like, it was so strange to me and i just hear in what you're saying the like the humanity right of like oh this is how we do this thing in a way that is respectful and honoring and doesn't other mm-hmm. right because it's like that was my sense of those seeing those those remains is like that's like you're just like that's a human that you were just made other Somehow, yeah. you know, of like, yeah. it's not our people anymore. I'm like that. Yeah, that could be my relative. Like, hey, <laughs> like, what's up with that? Uh, yeah. Any yeah. thoughts that you have on any of that? Yeah. Archaeology as a discipline, um, just historically, has been extractive, especially here in North America, where its foundations are in the decimation of Native American burial grounds. Like that is how that field came to be in existence here in the United States. Um, And the practice of extractive um, knowledge that does not include, that's not include like the epistemologies, like the knowledge formations of Native Americans, the knowledge formations of African Americans, people of African descent, when you're working on these African diasporic sites, um, there's a way that archaeology has been done and continues to be done, quite frankly, in this country that is still very abstracted, that is still very much about pilfering information, about otherizing people, and not about the communities that are impacted by this work. Um, The Society of Black Archaeologists, which was founded by myself and Justin Donovan, um, who is a fantastic scholar out at the out at Vanderbilt University. He'll be over at UCLA actually next fall, which I'm really excited about because we'll be in the same state again. But Justin and I founded SBA back in 2011, and it's been um, a nonprofit organization since 2018. And the main driving force for SBA was to be a lead in these discussions around the material well being of African diasporic sites. And part of this has come up around the sort of rise since the 1970s of archaeologists, predominantly white, working on African diasporic sites and not including. African um, diasporic descendant communities, black that di- di- black stakeholder communities are really being in conversations with black studies scholars who have brilliant formations, theoretical formations of how these sites, how these people existed, lived, and came to be. Um, so I feel like the like the response to your sharing is that. Archaeology as a practice, as a discipline, um, needs shifting, and it still needs shifting. And I feel like I've come across small pockets of archaeologists who are determined to do work differently. Um, 
And that different formation of it is humanizing people in the past and humanizing people in the present as well, where it's like, hey, if you are working at an archaeological site, then the people who lay claim to that site, be it through blood, be it through imagination, deserve to have a say in how things are done at that site, deserve to have a say in what stories are told about that site, how those stories are told. And that practice will look different based on the different locales that people are doing work in. But community engagement, the centering of community and well-being should be central to what we do as archaeologists rather than it being this drive or quest for objective knowledge that doesn't exist. Yeah, thank you for that. I um I hadn't thought about it as extractive. And that's actually a really helpful framing of this is, yeah, just another way that cultural appropriation or white supremacy works, right? Of, of this, like through this seemingly kind of innocuous practice of let's understand the peoples who came before us mm-hmm. without the, right, exactly what you're saying, considering the stakeholders. That's really helpful. I, um, I recently was, presented I'm, I think I'm still in the the quandary of it there's a um I live in western North Carolina on the on Cherokee land and um there's a like a huge antique market near where I live that's a fun place to go and they um they had I guess they're called like shadow boxes ools like maybe from like the 60s or 70s um, they had three of them that were full of uh, artifacts like arrowheads and axe heads and amulets and and different things from, and they were all tagged. Uh, so whoever the collector had been, like had found them and they said where they were from and stuff, but um, they're just like in this, this random antique barn and like, and they're, they're beautiful. And I was like, what's my responsibility here to these, to these things and to the, the people whose land these are from. And like, they're already out of the land and like, what's the right thing to do? It, it didn't feel right to like buy them and take them home and like ritually take care of them. And I was like, well, would I buy them and, and give them back to the Cherokee people? Like that seems like presumptuous and weird. Like, I don't know. It was anyway, it's been something that I've been sitting with for the past few months as I've been thinking about it. Um, just like, and, like and, I, and I think it leads to that, like what you were saying about extraction of like, what do we do once something's been extracted mm-hmm. and we can't go back, right? Like, we can't go back and like rehome those things where they exactly were. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And now they're just like out and it's like, I got, now it's a different kind of relic, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's a different kind of, of story mm-hmm. about, yeah. Any thoughts that you have that you want to share about that? And I think about when you say it's a different story and I'm like, I wonder what came to my mind was like, it's a story for who, you know, like there's a way that um, once, once the knowledge has been extracted, once the artifacts have been extracted, oftentimes the stories and the historical narratives that are created around it are not for the consumption of the people who it belonged to like it's is it a story for the Cherokee whose land those artifacts belong to and I think a lot about that when it comes to doing work at African diasporic sites as well because in archaeology in general there is um what people have called or dubbed like the um curation crisis in our field which is that we have facilities around the country that are overflowing with archeological material from a number of different sites related to a number of different peoples, racial, ethnicity, religious, um, and they're just sitting in boxes. And some of it are material remains. Some of it are like eco facts, like soil remains, organic remains. And then some of them are burial remains as well that are just sitting in boxes. And the question for me is always, well, what, what, what is it? What's the purpose of it? Like, what, what is the purpose of having everything extracted, pulled from the land, recovered, for it to just be in boxes? Like, there has to be some sort. For my, in my mind, I'm like, there has to be some sort of story that's told around it. Um, there has to be some sort of ways in which people 
who that material belongs to, especially have access to it, um, which doesn't always happen. And a complex example of this is on um, the island of St. Croix, where I currently do work. They have this jewelry um, made out of um, historical ceramics called Cheney. And Cheney is the sh is short for China that's been polished and rounded. Um, and Cheney jewelry are these um, are these historic ceramic artifacts that have been oftentimes extracted by folks who live on that land and then created or sold to different um, jewelry manufacturers on an island. And there are different levels of extraction for that. There are these very large sort of um, companies that are actively out and seeking and um, digging up historical sites. And then there are others, um, like a couple of artists that I know on St. Croix that come across these artifacts all the time as they're just gardening in their backyards because St. Croix is an island that was used in sugar production that from um, tip to tip had been covered in plantation sites. So the archeology, span the material culture underneath that ground is rich. You need only a shovel or a pick or a trowel that you're gardening with um, to really recover anything. Um, but the practice of creating this jewelry um, has caused a sort of like commotion amongst um, or among archeologists, especially there was like a conference that came down there two years ago where the archeologists were up in arms about these people who have lived on this land, for some of them for eight generations, and are using these historical artifacts to produce this jewelry. And part of my mind is like, yes, like there needs to be a conversation around what knowledge can come from the ceramics themselves. Like that is important. Like understanding historical context to be able to really talk about these sites and who these materials belong to, that is important. And also people on this island have created avenues of economic access that they otherwise do not have access to. And that is not something that can be ignored that the people who this material culture belongs to, the history that belongs to them, this is how they wanna share that history is in wearing it. That's a really powerful, story that shouldn't be ignored under the pretense of, um, well, they're just looting these sites. I'm like, uh, it's, it's a bit more complex than that. Um, but that's a story that's just sort of sparked my mind when it comes to um, these sort of uh, curiosity cabinets, as people would, um, would call them, where people just hoard different, different artifacts from different cultural groups and they're on display as status symbols in their households and things like that. Like that's one way that people are doing this. And then there are a lot of other ways that, especially local communities um, are trying to have conversations about the material culture um, from their past. Yeah, it's helpful. I mean, I think it's what I'm getting from our conversation is how many layers of story there are and that there's their kind of dominant paradigm stories, which assert themselves as like, this is the one true story. And then, um, but there's all these other like deeper layers and that those stories are, I mean, obviously equally or even more valid, um, but that they take some capacity building to be able to hold, right? Like you have to be able to hold the paradox of what you're talking about of what it is to want to wear that those jewel those yeah. jewelries, right? And what it is to right and just kind of the just the complexity of needs that where like where various communities like the archaeologists and the people who are actually living there, where they come into contact and clash a little bit of their needs or their mm -hmm. values or their mm -hmm. desires, mm -hmm. right? Like what do what do we want to do with um this? And I remember um yeah, I just remember when I, I, many years ago, I worked for the National Park Service, which was a terrible 
thing. But um, I do remember that, that that conversation about like having a resource and what do you do with that resource, right? How do you manage a resource in a way that makes it accessible and honors all the stakeholders? And yeah, but I, I think it really comes down to power and mm-hmm. desire also, right? Like what's actually going to happen comes down to that level of like, who's going to make the final yeah. say, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> If you, I'm, I'm curious if you want to talk about adornment and ancestors and sex. <laughs> yeah, I know that's that's kind of a vague lead in, but I, I'm just really aware that you're you are you're you're holding these very particular, you're weaving these threads, right, of adornment, of um, feminism, of storytelling, of archaeology, of blackness, right, if. Of all of, of of lands, like you're, that's. I mean, I guess this is your life work, mm-hmm. right? This is what you're doing with your life is weaving these threads. And so, yeah, I'm. I don't really have a more specific question, but like, it just seems really, I don't know, potent to think about like the connection between adornment and sexuality, yeah. especially on um, for Black women. Yeah. And I think a lot about um, desire comes up a lot for me and. When I initially started doing work um, on adornment, I remember having a conversation with my advisor um, and she wanted me to do a project that was ceramic based, which literally meant I would have been looking at thousands of pieces of ceramic and weaving together like conversations around economic access, um, aesthetic choice, things like that. And I told her, I was like, Maria, if I'm going to spend three years writing this, it has to be on something that I love. Um, And as much as I love ceramics and I think that they're beautiful and they do tell very powerful stories about choice, um, what I do um, outside of academia or that I've woven into my work as well is make jewelry. Um, And I make jewelry because there's always been this very powerful understanding for me, um, understanding for my mother who taught me how to make jewelry, um, that adorning ourselves um, is important. And the everyday practice of dressing our bodies um, is of importance. And it's of importance for me, and, and I think the wording that I got and sort of landed on, really pulled from this brilliant scholar, Omasheki Tinsley. She has a work, her first text called Thieving Sugar. Um, In that text, she talks about same-sex desire in the Caribbean and talks about um, women who loved other women and the practice during enslavement to love another body that was seen um, inhuman. Um, was really to put value in self in ways that society um, really worked to diminish. And the same thing for me came up around practices of adornment when it came to very what, um, because I think when people think about adornment, oftentimes, um, you know, especially when it comes to African-Americans, we think about high um, high dress styles of like our Sunday best, our fancy portraiture sort of dress um, throughout and over time. But I really look at just everyday practices of dressing the body and what it meant to put clothing on this body, what it meant being enslaved um, and finding different natural resources to shift and alter the clo- like the color of your clothing, to shift and alter the stitch of your frock, like all of that, all of the energy labor of twisting and bending metal to create wedding bands at times, what it meant to then have access to more um, mass produced goods, like in the latter half of the 19th century, like what it meant to really put labor, time, value, desire, on our bodies as um, Black people, specifically as Black women, um, in a society that deemed us only valuable 
by our labor and our reproductive labor at that, what did it meant to actually put um, value in other ways on our bodies, to dress ourselves, to do our hair? And I talk about that as a space of, for me, has just been a space of really saying, hey, like in these very small practices, we can talk about how people love themselves and loved others. Um, so I feel like it got, it got at this piece of, around desire in particular ways um, that I don't think gets talked about enough when we think about um, the era of enslavement. There's so much horror that's there because it is and it's real. Um, and there's this very complex space where like in the midst of very horrifying circumstances, um, people were loving themselves, people were loving others, people were building families, people were celebrating and worshiping in churches. Um, and one of the ways that we can get at that is how people dressed for each of those occasions. Ayana, would you be willing to share your personal practice for dressing and adornment? Sure. <laughs> 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 I will say that um, we're recording this during, you know, these horrifying COVID times. So my practice of dress and adornment is not. <laughs> it's like I have, I'm just like, oh no, like it dressed and I do things, but not nearly um, as much as I used to. So it's like, oh, I'm just sitting in my house and this is great. But for me, um, my own sort of personal practice of dress and adornment um, and just the sort of everyday routine of like showering to like clean my body, of putting oil on my body, if it's shea butter, if it's coconut oil, what essential oils I like to add to those if it's like, hey, does this feel like a Lang Lang sort of day? Does this feel like a rosemary and turmeric sort of day? Like what oils do I want to mix in with my own natural scent um, comes up for me around like what I do with my face where it's like, oh, I'm washing my face with my cream, but then I'm putting like my rose water witch hazel on afterwards and I'm just showing my body love and care, how I want to do my hair, how I want to present for myself, and then also how I want to present out in the world as well. I have, um, and a lot of my friends will laugh at me, I have a lot of jewelry made by other people as well as jewelry that I've made. But I have an entire like sort of section of my bedroom wall that just has all of my own adornments, be it necklaces, um, earrings, bracelets, rings, like just thinking about what I want to put on today. And there's a lot of intention that goes into that. Um, what clothing I want to put on, like I have, I'm very intentional about um, what I want to like wear and how I want to feel comfortable, like, and also am very much aware of like everything that I'm navigating outside of the world as well. And I'm fortunate that I don't have to be as concerned about that as my ancestors were. And that also still, that narrative still comes up. Um, so just in this practice of like, not only thinking about, um, you know, what sort of 3D sort of what I call like 3D supplements. So like what sort of clothing, jewelry um, that I'm doing, that I'm putting on my body, but also just the ways that I care for my actual body and my skin and my hair. Um, all of that is a practice of desiring myself and being in a state of desire for myself. You said you learned the importance of it from your yeah. mom. And um, I just wanted to take a little time to see if there's anything else that you want to share from your personal history about your personal ancestors. I know you have a, it's your great grandma, right? 
So my great grandmother is W. Lee um, Taylor. Uh, my great grandmother is W. Lee Tyler, and I my jewelry line is based off of her and her presence in my life. And she was the mother of my grandmother Sally Mae Wilborn, who's the mother of my mother Rona Carter. Um, and there's an image of W. Lee. Um, that I've used um, and that sits just like on my crafting table as well. Uh, it's like um, it's like a cameo of her almost. And she's tilted sideways and she's smiling. And when I came across that image, and it was when I was at my grandmother's house many years ago while she was still alive and she was going through these pictures. And I stopped at this image of a woman and I had not known W. Lee prior to that because my grandmother did not talk much about her mother who had passed away in her forties and had been fairly, um, for my grandmother, she had been fairly young when she lost her mother um, and had to care for her siblings after that. So it was the first time coming across this image that I got the name and I was like, this image I felt so drawn to it I was like oh no like this this image this person someone saying right now this is important um and I really felt like that was one of the first sort of like spaces that W. Lee showed up and was like hey there I am um and people who have seen that image have said that we look so much alike that she's gifted me her smile, which I say all the time. Um, but there's a way that um, both of us, and I, I just, I favor her so much and she's come through so much in the work that um, I'm doing. Um, but yeah, that's Debbie, that's Debbie Lee, who, you know, through conversations that I've had with my grandmother while she was living, um, and they were far and few in between, because like I said, um, there was a lot of hurt um, and trauma that was attached to that relationship. It felt like and sounded like. And my other um, family members, my grandmother's sister shared with me um, songs that she liked, shared with me that her favorite cake was coconut cake. Um, so I've just picked up little um, antidotes just around um, or over time about Debbie. Do you have any interest in singing a little bit? <laughs> a, so a song to her? To yeah. Debbie? Um, so yeah? Sylvia, my great aunt, um, who actually lives out in California, um, told me that one of Debbie's favorite songs was This Little Light of Mine. Um, so I could sing a little bit. Um, and I was going to do a disclaimer about my voice, and I decided not to. <laughs> ah, no, nah, don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if somebody's going to come on a podcast and sing their great grandma's favorite song, like, what a blessing, right? Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Okay. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Oh, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it, let it shine, this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. <laughs> amazing, amazing. Oh, blessings to yeah, W. Lee. Yeah. Uh, I hope she heard that. Yeah. <laughs> so sweet. I mean, can you like for reals? Can you imagine just like being wherever the ancestors are, being in all the ancestor land, and be like, "Oh, wait, what's that sound? Is that my great great granddaughter singing my favorite <laughs> song?" Like, how effing cool! <laughs> yes. And I think about because um, I sometimes have these um, when I think about my grandmother and I think about my grandfather, so Sally May and Jeremiah Carter, I sometimes think about them dancing uh, and they're probably dancing to some song by Marvin Gaye um, or Curtis Mayfield. I have this like album that has both of their, um, their initials on it. Um, so I know I'm like, oh, these were like their favorites. 
Um, but I think about them dancing and I think about Debbie as well. Like, oh, um, and there's something really powerful for me about singing and about the voice. And um, when I was an undergrad for like my first two years at the University of Florida, I was in the gospel choir. Um, and I have a really contentious relationship with Christianity now. But I will say that um, the voice, like singing gospel music, like those are pathways for spirit. Um, and we've definitely tapped, that is a, it's definitely a black tradition to really tap into the voice as a way to connect with our ancestors. And it still happens today. Like I know that if anything, like when my anxiety rises, I know that I could sing a song and it helps. And I know that it helps because of the vibration and who comes to comfort me in that. Like I, I know that that's why it works. Yeah, it's beautiful. And it's like, I think about how sound waves work. I mean, this it's kind of like archaeology, mm -hmm. actually. Because like if you like if you put a sound wave out, it just keeps going, right? It just like everything that has ever been said is still being said somewhere in the mm -hmm. universe, right? Those sound waves are still moving out. And so the, I'm just thinking about like your ancestors singing those songs, like there's still a resonance that's happening. There's still, it's happening yeah. somewhere, right? And when you, when you sing those songs, it's joining with, it's mm -hmm. a, yeah. Um, yeah, 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 that's beautiful. Anna, I am really so happy to have had time with you. And um, I just want to make some space to hear from you, like, you know, where, what can folks expect from you? Where can they find you? Anything you want to share about how to get in contact with yeah. you? Um, thank you again. This has been such a great conversation and so needed during these times as well. It's just nice to connect. You can definitely find me at www.ayanafawellen.com, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and my jewelry is at wsdivine.com. Um, and you can access that through my, through my first page as well. Um, and be on the lookout for my book. It's an upcoming project. I am still writing it and it is still in formation and it's been a beautiful and challenging experience, but it is all about um, the adornment of my great grandmothers, um, specifically in Texas during the reconstruction, I mean, po during reconstruction um, and really thinking about like how these brilliant and beautiful black women um, dress their bodies in their everyday lives. Um, but yeah, those are that's that's me where you can find me. Great, thank you. And just wanting to encourage folks to keep an eye on your work and keep an eye for your book, which is hopefully going to come out soon. And where can we get your jewelry? Do you have yeah, an Etsy shop? At dubbiesdivine.com. Yeah, dubbies, D O V I E S, divine.com. Divine or design? Sorry. Divine. Okay. Dovey Divine. Yeah. Dovey's Divine. Dovey's Divine. No apostrophe. Um, no apostrophe. Well, there is an apostrophe, but for the website, it's just Dovey's Divine. It's yeah. just Dovey's Design. Okay. Awesome. Wonderful. And um, just thank you so much. And I feel so inspired by listening to you and just listening to the work that you're doing and the pieces that you're holding and um, grateful. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much again. So just to our listeners, I want to thank you for listening to this episode of Bespoken Bones. And if you found this helpful, um, of course, check out Ayana's website and support her work in the world. And if you want to support Bespoken Bones, you can do that on Patreon. Um, we also have a new YouTube channel uh, where we're putting up all the shows um, and working on transcriptions of all the shows. So that um, is accessible on the website. And I'm just really glad to spend this special time with you and wishing you and your loved ones a lot of care in this weird moment that we're all in. I'm Pavani More. This is Bespoken Bones, and we'll be back every full new moon with more embodied goodness and ancestral wisdom. <laughs> <laughs>